All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everybody's enjoying their short week. It might just be me, but I definitely feel like um, getting Mondays off doesn't really lessen my workload. It just means I have less time to do the same amount of work. Maybe that's a, um, and again, I remember feeling very differently about things when I was in college. So maybe that's something that comes with um, getting getting a, a real job, which I did not have in college. So those of you who are working right now as well probably understand the way I feel. Anyway, let's go ahead and we're going to get started here. We're going to do some practice today with um, precipitation reactions. We're going to go through the quiz questions. <laughs> Excuse me. So right in the end of my, my uh, cold from last week, um, turns out giving your immune system like 18 months off and then getting sick again makes it feel like the end of the world. Um, but I'm just, just hanging just a little dry cough hanging around there. It's what happens when we get sick at altitude, right? All right. So we'll talk about precipitation reactions. We'll talk about the quiz questions and go through some examples with those um, and uh, work through the, this outline is totally outdated because we're moved on from just chemical reactions that we're now talking about specific chemical reactions. And we'll go into more practice using um, concentrations and another type of chemical reaction, we're gonna spend a significant amount of time talking about acids and bases today, um, which is the second to last big concept before we're done with the class. We're almost there. Um, this is week nine. We've got weeks 10 and 11 are lectures and then week 12 is finals week. So you guys are almost there. Good job hanging in there. Um, so we are nearing the end. Um, so let's talk, I have not finished getting through all the quizzes yet, but these are the, the some of the questions that people have asked thus far. Um, we'll start with a random one while everybody's still getting here. Um, one, is, one student asked, um, what is limiting terraforming? Um, terraforming being the process of changing the environment of an entire planet. Um, ideally, it's traditionally been used, that term has traditionally been used to refer to other planets rather than Earth, um, and with the idea of making them more habitable to humans. Um, so for something like Mars, it might include doing something like um, warming up Mars, giving it a breathable atmosphere, or at least an atmosphere period. Um, and so it winds, it winds up being sort of very, very large scale geology and chemistry and biology. Um, and there's some really interesting concepts and technology that go along with terraforming. Um, really, the terraforming in principle works just fine. It's just a matter of deciding that we want to actually do it. And then following through in a way that makes sure that we are not missing some large um, implications that could have a negative effect. Uh, so, for instance, we basically are terraforming Earth at this point and not in a good way. We are terraforming Earth through climate change by increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and increasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're making it warmer, which changes the climate overall, makes it causes lots of different changes. Um, and so that that is changing the environment on a global scale, on a planetary scale. Um, so it's definitely possible to do that. It's just a matter of making sure that we do it in a way that um, doesn't make things worse. And ideally, in a way that we could control it and stop it, and not allow it to cause a runaway reaction, um, which we're finding is the case with climate change, right? At this point, even if we stopped emitting any more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, um, climate change and global warming would continue to get worse for at least the next 50 years, um, just because these processes take a long time to slow down and we're dealing with numbers that are so big. Um, so there are lots of practical limitations, but they're not necessarily insurmountable if we, as a species or 
um, as a group decided to do that to another planet. It's just a matter of making sure um, we don't do anything that's going to cause more problems than it helps. Um, lots of questions about word problems and how to take words and descriptions of reactions and turn that into a stoichiometry problem. Um, so it is confusing, especially while you're getting used to the language. Um, there is not one universal approach that will work all of, every time. The way that the English language works and the way that um, that it gets translated into chemistry means that there's a lot of different ways that we can describe things, that we can describe chemical reactions, um, and that that results in, um, you know, almost infinite number of ways that I could phrase a limiting reactant question. Um, so I'm not, I'm going to try to not be too, um, not too uh, tricky about that and obscure about that. But it just, it just does take some practice to be able to read a sentence and pick out what is the question actually asking and translating that into chemistry terms and um, into chemical reactions and figuring out exactly what you're supposed to calculate. And so we're just going to keep working at it, keep practicing at it. It's like learning any language. The more you practice with it, the easier it is to convert between, between two different languages, right? And the more you're likely to get what the speaker originally intended. Um, so we'll keep working on that. Um, and there's some good, a good question about the difference between theoretical yield and actual yield. And I mentioned this before, but it's worth, worth describing again. Um, why is there a difference between theoretical yield and actual yield? And there are a number of different things that can cause this, um, but there are, and sometimes it's limitations in the lab. Sometimes the process of going through a filtration, for instance, means that some of your product gets stuck on a filter paper instead of being able to scrape it onto a watch glass and weigh it. Um, so some of it is just physical limitations that way. But, but what's really interesting is something that I talked about a little bit last time, um, the idea that you can have a weak electrolyte, where things can, can be partially soluble. Not every process that happens in chemistry happens 100% of the time. Or what it does, but sometimes you can wind up with, say, um, if we have an acid-base reaction that looks like something like water plus ammonia, when you, when you dissolve ammonia in water, you wind up with an acid-base reaction happening where the ammonia steals a hydrogen ion from the water and it turns into a hydroxide ion and ammonium. The thing is that this doesn't happen 100% of the time. What happens when you put ammonia and water together is that there's some probability that the water molecule and an ammonia molecule run into each other and it makes this product happen. Um, and you wind up making the, the product shown here. But there's also a possibility that the hydroxide runs into an ammonium. And when these two, when the two products run into each other, you can actually have the reaction happen backwards. And so most, pretty much all chemical reactions, um, if you get down to enough sig figs, if you measure things carefully enough, pretty much all chemical reactions, what we call equilibrium reactions, where they can happen forward or they can happen backwards. And if you get to the point where the red arrow is happening just as fast as the blue arrow, then it looks like nothing's really changing. So, this is a reaction that happens when you put ammonia in water. We can watch this reaction happen. We can watch the pH of water change when you put ammonia in it. So we know this reaction happens, but it only happens like 3% of the time. If we actually measured the percent yield of this reaction, it would only be, you know, it would depend a little bit on our concentrations, but it might only be 3 to 5% yield. 
that doesn't mean that you did the reaction wrong. It means that the reaction itself is limited to only happening a certain percentage of the time. Because it, if it happens any more than that, then you wind up with extra stuff on the right-hand side and it winds up reacting faster to go backward. So you always are gonna wind up with these two reactions basically canceling each other out at some point. And that's not always at 100% yield. So even if you ignore all of the lab stuff of I spilled a little bit or I couldn't get it all off of the filter paper or my recrystallization didn't work properly, um, and I lost some yield there. Even if you did all that stuff, all the purification stuff perfectly, you're still limited by the reaction itself, which means you're limited by the energy of the and their concentrations before and after the reaction is done. Um, and if you take GenChem, we will actually spend about at least at least six weeks. This, this idea of equilibrium and how we can predict how far the ex we can expect the reaction to go. Um, we will actually spend probably six weeks out of, out of three quarters um, just on equilibrium. And that is one of the biggest concepts from general chemistry that you take forward into other classes because this applies to biology reactions. This applies to um, phase change. This applies to anything that happens in any field is really an equilibrium reaction. It's just how close does it get to completion? Right, so a lot of reactions, especially at this level, we're gonna deal with reactions that are where the forward arrow is so big, we can essentially say that within sig figs, the reaction goes to completion and we can just use stoichiometry. But as we get more sophisticated about understanding some of these reactions, we have to get more sophisticated about predicting how much product we're gonna make as well. So I I really like that question because it gives me a chance to lead into what we're going to talk about today, which is strong and weak acids and bases. And it also leads into the last question that we have on here, which is chemistry seems like it has a lot of math in it. Is there a need to take more math as I move forward? Um, that depends. Depends on how much you like chemistry and depends on what you're planning on studying. If you're going to take the Gen Chem series, um, getting more comfortable with algebra is really, really helpful. And we'll talk about some things in terms of rates. Um, and some, some concepts that we'll talk about are kind of are based around some calculus ideas. You don't have to know how to do the calculus in, chem in Gen Chem, but it can be helpful to understand the idea that an integral is basically is like saying um, finding the area underneath a curve, for instance, or that a rate is basically um, the slope of a line at any given point. We're gonna we talk about things like rates um, and basically predicting how fast a reaction happens. Um, and if you understand calculus and how derivatives work, at least on a conceptual level, that can be really helpful to understand some of these concepts. It's not required. All you need to take Gen Chem um, is basic algebra. If you can do basic algebra, you can take Gen Chem and do, and do well at it. Um, you just might struggle with some of these more mathematical concepts. Um, but if you're going into a scientific or engineering field um, and you're going to take then you probably are going to wind up taking more math at some point. I believe biology majors, um, it's recommended that you take at least the first the first calculus course, um, especially if you're pre med or pre pre health. Um, but if you're not taking any more chemistry going forward, you don't need to take more math. But it is all generally helpful in understanding what's going on um, and some of the the mathematical rules that we follow in chemistry and in other sciences. All right, so let's talk about the quiz questions a little bit. Um, so we started with a balancing reaction and then a mole-to-mole -mole, um, reaction. And just for reference, um, 
parts one and two, if you put them together, that's basically, that's going to be 10% of the final. I can tell you right now, I'm, there will be a question that's worth 10% of the final. That is basically questions one and two. Here's a reaction. Here are the amounts of moles of the two reactants. Balance it and tell me how much product you can make. Right, so this is be, this is a good one to understand and just to throw that throw it up there so you can see what I'm talking about on the test. There's there's one right there. Balance the following reaction and determine how many moles of silver chloride can be produced from 2.44 moles of calcium chloride and 4.10 moles of silver nitrate and write the reaction type. Boom. That right there is 10% of your grade on your final exam. And I think after all the work we've done on stoichiometry, everybody should be able to at least get most of the points on this one. I think everybody at least understands the ideas of balancing, even if you still get hung up from time to time. Um, and the idea of figuring out limiting reactant and theoretical yield, especially if I start you off in moles, right? So this, this problem, problem seven, and it will be problem seven, um, will be basically something you should get at least eight, eight points on with, and only spend about three or four minutes on it, right? This is a, this type of problem is one you really want to get good at. And then the, beyond that, there's another 30% of the test is going to be stoichiometry problems where I just, where you have to go start from grams and go to grams of product or start from a concentration and figure out concentration of product, right? So just more of the same, really, just more practice. Um, and I think just about everybody was able to get this um, reaction balance. This is methanol, which is camp stove fuel, um, combusting with oxygen to make CO2 and water. I believe we need to do a two here. And that means a four here, two there, and then oxygen. That means we need one, two, three, four minus two means three oxygens. I'm looking at that properly. I can't zoom in too much or it wraps it around. Um, but if we balance all that out, on the right-hand side, we have two carbons. Left is two carbons. On the right-hand side is um, eight hydrogens. On the left-hand side is eight hydrogens. Uh, on the right-hand side is eight oxygens. And on the left-hand side, there's two oxygens in the methanol. And then so we need another six oxygens, so three O2 molecules, which means and if you got that part right, then the next step of figuring out how many moles carbon dioxide are produced when two moles of oxygen reacts, you just have to start with, you have two moles O2. And for every three moles of O2, we make two moles of CO2. So that would give us an answer of 1.3 moles CO2. Right, and so we sh definitely should be getting to the point where we're feeling good. And even if you got the wrong answer on this, it should have gone quickly and you should see that where you made your mistake. Um, it's a, we've been working on this pretty well. So I, hopefully everybody's looking at that. Says, oh yeah, I missed it, but duh, that was, that was easy. I should have just done this over here. Um, or I just, you know, misbalanced the oxygens or something. Questions three and four. Question three also relates to the same 
hmm. Same reaction. So we can write it in there. So it's 15 grams, 15.0 grams. So let me uh, switch to a whiteboard view. So it was uh, two CO two plus four H O, and we've got fifteen point zero grams of ethanol of methanol so if we and we want to get to how many grams of water so this is a mass to mass calculation we're going to start by taking our 15 grams of methanol putting it in moles of ethanol of excuse me methanol and we can go from moles of methanol to moles of water, and then use the molecular weight of water to go from moles of water to grams of water. So 15.0 grams. Um, and let's see, methanol is gonna be 12 plus four plus 16. So 32.05 or so grams is one mole of the methanol. And it's totally fine if you stop and hit equals right there and just get an answer, or you can do it all in one step. 15 over 32.05, and we get 0.468. That's moles of methanol. We want to keep track of moles of what, right? Sorry, I got close to the edge of my screen and I can't write that O properly. So once we get to moles of methanol, we can take that number, say 0 0.468 moles CH4O. Now we just use our stoichiometry step, our balancing step. For every two moles of methanol, we make four moles of water. That should give me 0 0.934, 936. I doubled that correctly. 936, yep. So then last but not least, because this question asks for grams of water, we just use the molecular weight of water, to take our expected moles of water and turn it into grams. So 0 0.936 moles of H2O. And for every one mole H2O, we're going to let me switch color so this doesn't get too crowded to read. Be 18.02 grams. Again, just from the periodic table, just using the periodic table to give us our, um, our um, molecular weights. So I get 16.9. Right. 
So any questions on this one? Any place in particular that you got hung up? Okay, I'm gonna switch back to the other screen. As soon as I check the chat questionnaire. Okay, good. All right, so, and again, I get that these are, these are questions that when I'm up here doing it are a lot easier than when you get a blank sheet of paper in front of you, um, but it comes from practice, right? Because being able to look at this question and know what it's asking takes a little bit of practice. How many grams of water are produced? So in other words, we're looking at making product and here's our reactant, right? So being able to take that and rewrite it as um, the chemi chemical reaction, or if you have the chemical reaction, being able to look at it and say, okay, it's asking me 15.0 grams here, and I, for whatever reason, I always organize my thoughts on these problems by getting the balance reaction and then writing down what I have underneath um, each reactant. Right, so I would look at that problem written as a word problem, and my first thought would be to rewrite it like this, because that helps me organize my thoughts and just puts it in the context of, oh, all it is is a theoretical yield question. And I've done those before. Right. Granted, this was a pretty easy one to look at and see. Um, you know, That's not that tricky of a word problem. If a, you don't have the reaction written out ahead of time, like on question four, it gets a little trickier. But remember, all of this is building on itself. We're using the skills that we've come up with before. So for instance, figuring out what the formula is for lithium nitrate. Well, if you know it's lithium nitrate, you know it's an ionic compound, which means you know you have to set it up so that your charges add up to zero. And then getting the entire reaction and writing it out, again, is a little tricky, takes practice, but there are key words in there, like lithium metal. Anytime you're dealing with a metal, that means you're dealing with the neutral ion or the neutral um, elemental state of something. So if it says lithium metal reacts with aqueous zinc nitrate, well, lithium metal any, is just going to be lithium as a solid, no charge. Zinc nitrate, well, I don't necessarily know the formula, have the formula memorized, but I know that it's an ionic compound and I know that zinc, when it's charged, is gonna have a plus two. And you might have to go back and check your polyatomic ions, but when you do, you find out that nitrate is NO3 with a negative one charge. So again, go back to our other skills that we've used for a while now and say, okay, therefore, I know that I have to have two nitrates for every one zinc. So the formula for this compound has to be zinc with two nitrates and it's aqueous. Oops. And I forgot to put the two there. I just said it verbally. Zinc with two nitrates and it's all aqueous. My stylus is being a little finicky today. So please excuse the messiness on some of these. All right, so that's the reactant side. It's lithium metal reacts with aqueous zinc nitrate. That's what we just react, we just wrote. And it says to form. That's a key. There's pretty much always going to be a couple verbs in there. 
they're going to tell us if it's if we're talking about reactants or if we're talking about products. So reacts with. That's a key that that's a verb that tells us that these two things are reacting together. In other words, they're the reactants. If it says to form or to make or to produce or makes as a product, anything that qualitatively is talking about making something means that that's going to be on our products, right? To form zinc metal in lithium nitrate. Well, zinc metal, and I'm just going to start. Um, I'll use a different color and write it on the next line here to make zinc metal. And lithium nitrate and lithium nitrate, we can do the same thing. Lithium has a plus one charge when it's an ion. Nitrate is still NO3 with a negative one charge. So lithium nitrate is one nitrate for every one lithium. And it doesn't specifically say it's aqueous. Um, if you checked your sol solubility rules, you see the lithium and nitrate, we're always going to make something that's aqueous. They're never going to form a, a solid there. But if you didn't do that, if you just left that off, that was fine. In fact, all I was really looking for is for you to take this and then balance it to give me a theoretical yield as far as, as getting your answer for this. Um, you do have to balance it though, because you have two nitrates on the left, which means you have to make, you have to be making two or having two nitrates on the product side, which means our lithiums are now not balanced. So we're gonna have to put a two in front of the lithium metal. Now everything's balanced, I believe. Right, so getting from the verbal or the written description to a balanced chemical reaction, again, takes practice. And that's why it's so important that you know your rules for nomenclature so that you can look at, at the name zinc nitrate and know that it's this formula. Right, that's why nomenclature is important. Because if you messed up your, your formula for zinc nitrate, then you probably messed up your balancing. If you messed up your balancing, you're not going to get the right answer, right? All right, so we wanted to then take this and figure out how much zinc metal we can make. I'm going to do the same thing and I did before and go switch to a whiteboard here. Actually, um, all right, so we had Two lithium did this in a slightly different way, and all of a sudden it's not looking quite the same. Two lithium as a solid plus zinc nitrate. goes and makes zinc metal plus lithium nitrate, and there's two of them. All right, and the question is, if we have, let me get make sure I get the numbers correct here, 1.5 grams of lithium, and 31.25 grams of zinc nitrate. So once we get to this point, 
first thing we want to do is put everything in moles. Right. And actually, I mean, theoretically, you could, we have two amounts here. We need to know what the limiting reactant is before we can tell how much product we can make. And in the interest of writing things down consistently, it says how many grams of zinc metal are formed. So we're trying to get to how many grams. So it's a theoretical yield question, but we also have to figure out the limiting reactant in order to know which theoretical yield is correct. So we could start, we could put them both in um, moles and write them here and then figure out limiting reactant. That's probably the way that's most consistent with what we've done so far. So 1.5 grams of lithium and Lithium has a atomic mass of seven point something. So I'm trying to zoom is really picky about what it lets you minimize when you're what is it? Six point nine four. Thank you. Zoom is really picky about what it lets you minimize when you're recording things. So I can't get to my desktop to see my periodic table. So 1.5 over 6.94. 0 0.21 or 2, 2. How many sig figs did we have here? 1.50, so 0 0.216 moles lithium. We do the same thing with the zinc nitrate. We have a lot more of the zinc nitrate, but it's also going to be a much larger molecular weight. So if we use the molecular weight of zinc and nitrogen and oxygen, we're going to get a molecular weight of 65.39 for the zinc plus two nitrogens, which is 14.008. And we have six oxygens, so six times 15.999. get 189.4 is one mole of zinc nitrate. Thirty one point two five over one eighty nine point four. at 0 0.165, and actually 164, 16, okay, so we're on our way here. And if we clean this up, um, again, once you get good at these, you can look, you could look at this and probably tell which of these is going to be the limiting reactant. And it's not necessarily the one that you have the least of because we're using the lithium up twice as fast. But once you get to this point, um, if you can't just look at it and see that, um, the, and the way to show your work, which is a better idea anyway, is take both of these and figure out how many moles of zinc metal you can make.
whichever number is lower means that must be the, the right answer because that's going to be the one and it's going to tell us what runs out first. So we say 0 0.216 moles of lithium and for every two moles lithium you can make one mole of product. So we'll get 0 0.108 moles of zinc. If we start from the zinc nitrate, 0 0.1650 moles of zinc nitrate. And every one mole of zinc nitrate, makes one mole product. So we're gonna get the same number out, right? 1 0 0.1650 moles of zinc. So if we wanna know which of these is gonna run out first, it's the one that makes the least product. And the one that makes the least product is lithium. So lithium is gonna run out first, which means it's also giving us our theoretical yield. We can, in theory, make at most 0 0.108 moles of zinc. After that, we've run out of lithium and there's nothing we can do about it. So to get that in grams, for the sake of this problem, we take that 0.108 and we multiply by the molecular weight of, of the zinc metal, because if we're gonna be making 0 0.108, moles zinc, then we can take the molecular weight and it says for every one mole of zinc is 65.39 grams of zinc. 0 0.108 times 65.39, 7.06 grams of zinc. All right, so lots of steps to this one. And the fact that I gave it to you as a unbalanced verbal description, written description of the reaction instead of the reaction itself meant you had to, you had to work your way through that. Um, but nothing in this is inherently any different than what we've done before, right? It's just putting it all together and not messing up anywhere along the way. And which is, sounds a lot easier than it is, right? Um, I will just go ahead and tell you um, that I have never, I think I can say this, I've never had a student get, turn in a perfect exam. Um, if you've taken lots of math classes before, um, you may have had gotten lots of perfect scores on your math test or something like, you know, whatever tests you've taken, it's possible in most classes to get 100% on it. Um, that's almost impossible on a chemistry test. And I don't say that to just, oh, my tests are so hard. It's just that there are so many tiny places to screw up because of all of, if you just mess up sig fig somewhere, then all of a sudden it's not a perfect problem anymore. You can do everything right and miss, mess up the sig figs and not get the right answer. I mean, you still get close to the right answer, but it's just, it's really hard to not miss any of these details until you get really, really well practiced at it. So don't get discouraged if you get, you know, if the test marks or the quiz marks you as a zero because you didn't balance your reaction right. So you're, um, you figured out the wrong limiting reactant or something like that, right? That's, 
I give lots of partial credit for that reason. I know it's really hard to get these perfect. Um, and the odds of doing it, getting all 10 sections perfect on the final is basically none. You, you're going to mess up sig figs somewhere, or you're going to go too fast and write a one when you meant a six or something like that. I, it's just the way that the, this class is. And um, so perfectionism is not something to strive for in chemistry. Good enough to get an A is something to strive for in chemistry classes or good enough within sig figs. Right. Within sig figs, if you got a 99.7 on the test, within sig figs, you can call that a perfect test, right? Sig figs cut both ways. All right, let's take a little break and we'll come back and we will do some more practice with precipitation reactions and start getting into acid base reactions. All right, so let's come back at 225 and we will keep going.
All right, let's bring it back. Sorry about the longer than normal wait. I got caught up writing an email and lost track of time. So um, that's okay. This time of quarter, everybody needs a little bit more break than normal, right? Um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit more about precipitation reactions because it's also going to inform how we talk about our acid-base reactions. Um, so the way we've been writing these is what's known as the um, molecular equation, right? where we start with something with two things that are aqueous, and then we make a solid compound and another aqueous compound. And really the aqueous compound is just whatever else, whatever's left over, right? Whatever doesn't stick together to make a, a precipitate. Um, however, we've also talked about this a little bit in, in class. These, when we have these aqueous ionic compounds, they don't really stay as individual molecules when you dissolve them in water. When you have them in their aqueous, really what you have is you have a bunch of ions separated from each other floating around. So if you have lead to nitrate as an aqueous solution, what you really have is lead ions floating around and nitrate ions floating around, right? So basically what we're doing is we're taking these, if it's an ionic compound that's aqueous, we're going to take it and split it up into its pieces. And that way we can make what's called the total ionic equation. Um, and we do the same thing with the potassium iodide. So potassium iodide, when we split it up, turns into aqueous iodide or potassium ions and aqueous iodide ions. So it's all the same pieces that are there. And if we have the if the molecular equation is balanced, then our total ionic equation should also be balanced. And then what's different about the other side is that when we make a solid, we still write it as a compound. We don't split up the solid ions because that's what makes it a solid is the fact that it's not splitting up and dissolving in water. So these soluble or sorry, these insoluble compounds, when we make a precipitate, we just write it still as that molecular form. So as lead iodide. But then the other pieces are still there. We still have, the, the potassium did not form a solid, neither did the nitrate. They're both still aqueous floating around. Right, so for the potassium nitrate, nothing really changed. The potassium ions are still the potassium ions. The nitrate ions are still the nitrate ions. They didn't stick together to make a solid. They didn't do any reacting whatsoever. And so that idea is what leads to this last <clears throat> form of writing these precipitates. Um, and that's the idea that you can have a net ionic equation. So in business classes or in econ or in, in engineering, net just means it's the difference between what you started with and what you end with. So for instance, if you, um, if you make $1,000 a month waiting tables, but um, $20, $250 of that goes to the government for taxes, then your net is what you actually take home. Um, so it's in this case, the net reaction is whatever's changing is what is all we're going to write. Anything that stays the same before and after didn't really change. We had it before, we still have it at the end. You know, if there's no net change to an ion, we just leave it off in the net ionic equation. So the net ionic equation is basically only writing down the pieces that react together. In this case, the lead and the iodide, which react together to make lead iodide. And so this is actually a really, really easy way to write it. It basically 
let it uh, ignores the stuff that's not changing and only shows you the meat and potatoes, the stuff we actually care about in these precipitation reactions. Um, these three different forms, though, can be really helpful in terms of understanding what's still floating around in solution. Probably the most common way you will see these written is in the as the molecular equation. Um, however, the total ionic equation is still helpful. Even though it's a lot of writing, it's still useful in a lot of cases to show as the most accurate description of what's happening in these, these aqueous reactions. Um, and the net ionic equation is really helpful in that it's fast and easy to write. It doesn't require a lot of space and it gets to the heart of what's actually changing, what's actually happening uh, in the course of these reactions. Um, so for instance, another way, another one of these that we could write would be um, and I'll write it just in the um, total or the net ionic equation is when you, if you have hard water, you have calcium ions or magnesium ions dissolved in your water as a result of the aquifer that the water passes through um, before it's, or because of the, the minerals in the soil, if it's, um, if it's surface water. Um, we don't typically write the other, the negative ion, the anion that goes along with this because the net ionic equation is all that really matters. And the net ionic equation is if you have hard water, anytime you have your water exposed to air, it's exposed to carbon dioxide, which when it dissolves in water can make carbonate ions. So our net ionic equation um, for making calcium carbonate or lime scale, a major component of lime scale, is just calcium ions aqueous plus carbonate aqueous forms a solid precipitate, calcium carbonate. And when we find calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate is um, a component of shellfish, shells it's a component uh it's the major component of limestone of chalk uh, it's a really common compound and it's also that gunky yellowish white stuff that builds up on your shower head um if you if you go if you have hard water or if you go a long time without um without cleaning your shower head off and the net ionic equation would just be written like this ideally on one line instead of vertically, but um, I think you guys can, can see the picture there. All right, so the, um, the ionic equations wind up showing up a lot. And I don't always, when I'm trying to, to do one of these on the fly, um, I don't always differentiate between the different types of writing these out. Um, if I don't tell you what type of reaction I want you to write, the safe bet is writing it as the molecular equation. Um, I frequently, though, at least on the test, will have you write all three forms for the same reaction just like this. So you can show me you understand what these terms are and how to do this. All right. So hopefully everybody has a um, table of solubility rules handy. If not, I will put that up on another sheet once I rearrange this to make room. Um, for each of these, write out the molecular equation, total ionic equation. Let's, let's just do A and B for now. We'll save C and B for practice um, this weekend or on Monday. Um, if a solid forms, write out the molecular equation, total ionic equation, net ionic equation. If no reaction forms, just write out the, the reactants as a molecular equation uh, and just write NR for no reaction. So give that a go. Remind yourself how the solubility rules work, and I'll put some up on the screen here in a second.
right, so for any of these, start by writing out the reactants and then check your solubility table to see if you made a combination that's insoluble. So if we start with potassium carbonate, you need to remember that potassium is, switch to a better color. Potassium is gonna make a plus one charge. Carbonate is gonna be a two minus charge. So potassium carbonate is gonna be K2CO3. And then lead two nitrate. The lead two, the two is referring to the charge on the lead, right? And if we remember that nitrate is NO3 with a negative one. This is one reason why it winds up being beneficial to, um, to have your polyatomic ions memorized uh, is because that way you don't wind up having to juggle four different sheets of paper, a periodic table, solubility rules, list of polyatomic ions, all just to write out this one reaction. Um, it definitely speeds things up if you don't have to go back and check the formula for nitrate. Um, so that means you're going to need two nitrates for every one lead two ion. So our formula would be lead PbNO3 two aqueous and the possibilities for what we can do with that. We could either have the if we're going to see a precipitate form. It's either going to be potassium with the nitrate or lead with the carbonate, right? Because we already know that potassium carbonate is aqueous. We already know, so it's, the, it's soluble. We already know that lead nitrate is soluble. But if we look at lead to carbonate, or we look at potassium nitrate, we just need to see if either of these combinations is insoluble. So now we just want to check the per our solubility rules. We can say that we see that nitrates soluble with no exceptions. So we know that we're going to wind up making an aqueous sodium nitrate, sorry, potassium nitrate. And realize that's a little bit hard to read, but that's the part, that's the piece that's not as important, right? Because that's soluble. Lead carbonate means, so if we're going to make a solid product, it's going to be the lead carbonate. And lead is not really anywhere on our chart but carbonates are and they're in the insoluble column carbonates are insoluble except for group one ammonium and uranyl is uh i believe that's referring to a uranium compound although usually i would expect uranium to not be soluble so maybe that's a polyatomic ion it's referring to um so lead carbonate, lead to carbonate, we would expect to be insoluble. So we're making a solid. Right. So if we wanted to if we wanted to draw the other two forms of this equation. This would be the, the molecular equation. If we want the total ionic equation, we draw all of the ions out separately. Um, and it's not a bad idea at this point to balance it. Our lead and our carbonate are balanced, but we'd have two nitrates and two potassiums. So to make it balanced, we would do that. To write the total ionic equation, we draw everything that's there. So two, Potassium aqueous plus 
carbonate. Aqueous plus lead two aqueous plus two nitrates aqueous. That's our reactant side. Our product side is gonna be more or less the same, except that two of our pieces turned into a solid. So I'm gonna write it on a new line. That's totally acceptable for these because it's kind of hard to fit all this on one line in a sheet of binder paper too. Our solid product we made was the lead carbonate, or sorry, lead two carbonate. So we made lead two, carbonate as a solid. Plus, we still have two potassium ions and two nitrates. So that would be our complete ionic equation, would be this entire thing here to here. And if we want the net ionic equation, all we're going to do is take the complete ionic equation and anything that doesn't change, we cross it off. Anything that's the same on the products and the reactant side means it didn't do anything. Nothing happened to it. So we just don't write it in our net ionic equation. So two potassiums and two potassiums. We're gonna cross those off. Two nitrates and two nitrates. We're gonna cross those off. So our net ionic equation is just lead to aqueous plus carbonate aqueous turns into lead to carbonate solid. Right, so I know scientists and chemists in particular are pretty pedantic about their language and very, very nitpicky. Um, but that means that if you pay attention, the names typically are actually very, very descriptive. So memorizing what is complete ionic equation versus net ionic equation you just have to look at the names. Complete ionic equation means everything as ions. Net ionic equation means only the stuff that's changing as ions. And the molecular equation means everything as its individual pieces. Any questions on this one? Um, so I'll only do the molecular equation for this one I'll, um, for B, and I'll let you work practice doing the total and net ionic equations. Lithium sulfate. We look at the charges on each of them. Sulfate's a negative two charge, so it takes two lithiums. Aqueous. And let, lead to acetate. Acetate's a negative one charge, so we're going to need two acetates for every one lead two ion. Okay. 
And when we look at these sulfates, uh, it's a little bit hard to see depending on how you have your screen set up. Um, sulfates are on the bottom row of our of our solubility table there. Um, and they're on the soluble side. They're soluble except for lead two. So that tells us we're going to be making an insoluble compound. Lead to sulfate. And we still have the lithiums and we still have the acetates floating around. So 2Li C2H3O2 aqueous. So our complete ionic equation would have everything but the solid split up into its ions. The net ionic equation would just have the lead ions plus the sulfate ions turns to lead, lead to sulfate as a solid. Right, so these solubility tables really have a lot of information on them if you know how to look at it, just like the periodic table, right? Periodic table has an immense amount of information on it if you know how to look at it properly and decode it. Same with these um, solubility rules. Sean? Yeah. Hi, I wonder if you could just give, again, I know you did, but uh, one or two word definition for each, molecular equation, net ionic equation, and total. Yeah, so Thank for you. the molecular equation, you're writing everything, yeah, you're writing everything as the, in, as the compound, so. Every, the total, okay. Mm -hmm. Everything as it's, as the um, compound. And meaning that all ionic compounds, even if they're aqueous, you still write them together. So um, copper two nitrate, you would be written as two nitrates for every one Cu2 plus, and they're dissolved in water, so it's aqueous. For both of the ionic equations, anything that's any ionic equation or ionic compound that's aqueous, you split it up into its pieces. So for both of those, you would take the copper two nitrate and you would split it up into copper two aqueous and two nitrates aqueous. All right, so that's what it means by ionic. It means you're taking everything and writing it as separate ions instead of sticking them together as the molecular equation. Right. And the difference between total and net is total means you write everything and net you only write the stuff that turns into a precipitate. Right. So total equation, ionic equation, I, we know that if copper two nitrate, we know that the nitrate's not going to form a solid because nitrate's down here on, its, on the soluble side with no exceptions. So we know that nitrate's not going to make a solid. In the total ionic equation, we would still write the nitrate in there anyway because we have it in our system. In the net ionic equation, we would leave the nitrate off because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't form a solid. Got it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> little no slow problem. Today. <laughs> no worries. And then for that, if you go back a page from here, it's got an example where you got the same reaction written out all three ways. The top one's the molecular equation where everything's put together. 
We've got the total ionic equation where everything is split up except for the solid that we make. And the net ionic equation where we only write the stuff that's changing. So we, we ignore the nitrate and the potassium because they don't do anything. And we only have the lead and the iodide. Um, here's more stoichiometry practice, but since we did some practice earlier today with the um, with the quiz, I'm going to leave this for now, and we'll either do it at the beginning of lab or we'll save it for the beginning of um, class on next Monday. So I only see you guys once this week. Um, and we're going to talk spend the last 20 minutes talking about acids. Um, so remember that acid-base reactions um, were one of our classes of reactions to begin, begin with. Um, if we, just to review real quick, um, out of chemi all of our chem possible chemical reactions, we split them up initially into either redox reactions if things were changing Anything changes oxidation state. Or we did, we called it a complexation reaction. Those are the, the Lego reactions. And complexation reactions meant nothing was changing oxidation states. We're just taking the pieces, no electrons are moving really. We're taking the pieces we have and rearranging them. And so our two most common forms of complexation reactions were precipitation reactions and acid-base reactions. All right, and so as precipitation reactions, it's pretty clear looking at it now, now that we understand what they are a little bit more and we practice with these solubility rules, if it's a nitrate at the beginning of the reaction, it's still a nitrate at the end of the reaction. If it's a carbonate at the beginning, it's still a carbonate. If it's lead two before, it's still lead two. So nothing's changing oxidation states. We just get precipitation reactions happening when we make a specific combination of ions that no longer dissolves in water. Right, so easy to balance, easy to predict what the products are or whether there are products or no reaction, if you have that solubility table, acid-base reactions were a little bit trickier to put a finger on because it looks like things change charge a little bit. But the oxidation states are not changing because all we're really moving is a hydrogen ion. We're moving a hydrogen ion from one place to another. So all, everything still has all of its same electrons. The charges can look a little bit different, but, but we're not changing oxidation state. We're just changing where these H pluses are. And that's what makes it an acid-base reaction. So to, to dig into this a little deeper so that we can see these acid-base reactions in action a little bit more, um, it turns out that depending on what kind of chemistry you're practicing uh, or where you live in the world of science as far as your career or what you're studying, there are actually several different definitions of acids um, that are going to be... Um, would you just connect right now? Talk to me later. Um, so in some places, if you care, if you're in... Um, metallurgy or material science, you might care mostly about this first definition, which just is uh, named after a chemist named Svante Arrhenius, a S Swedish guy. Um, and Svante Arrhenius basically said an acid is anything that when you put it in water, it increases how many H pluses you have floating around, which 
okay, that may or may not be all that helpful. It just tells us that we may, we're making a solution more acidic when we add an acid to it. Um, so it's a really broad definition. We're not going to use that one that much. The one that we're going to use the most, um, and actually, so the, let's talk about the third one right now as well. Um, Lewis acids really get used a lot if you're in organic chemistry or in, in uh, organometallic chemistry. Anytime you're dealing with, um, with metal ions reacting with organic things, then Lewis acids wind up being a useful definition. Um, but for the most part, for most biological and biochemical contexts, and really the, the most basic way of understanding acids and bases is this middle one, Bronsted-Lowry. A Bronsted-Lowry acid just is just anything that can give up an H+. And H plus will frequently rewrite that just because H plus or hydrogen ion doesn't roll off the tongue very well. Um, would call an H plus a proton because if you have a hydrogen atom, it's a nucleus that has a single proton in the middle and then it's got one electron around it, right? But if you take away that electron to make it an H plus, all the all you really have is the nucleus, which is just a single proton. So you frequently hear things referred to as being proton donors or increasing the concentration of protons. That doesn't mean we're changing what's in the nucleus of anything. It just means that it's, it's something that's giving away or a, uh, a, an H plus ion. Hang on one second. All right. The upside to it being warm, warm enough that we can turn the kids out into the backyard with the sprinklers and just let them play for hours at a time. Um, the upside to that is they're very tired. The downside is that they're very tired. Um, so those of you who have small children or have had small children know that tired small children are argumentative small children. Or maybe that's just mine. Um, so for the most part, if we're talking about acids, we're going to talk about it in the context of whatever's giving up an H plus, whatever's donating an H plus is our acid. So in the case of hydrogen chloride, if you take hydrogen chloride and you dissolve it in water, it actually splits up like an ionic compound into H pluses and Cl minuses. So this actually fits both of the first two definitions pretty well, because when you dissolve HCl in water, it increases the concentration of H plus ions and hydrogen chloride, the gas is giving away an H plus. Although this isn't the most accurate way we can write this. Because it turns out that if you dissolve HCl in water, you actually get reacting with the water and for the for ionic compounds dissolving we didn't write it like this we just said you know for say sodium solid sodium chloride dissolving in water it just we just wrote it as sodium chloride turns to sodium ions and chloride ions The water basically was there and played a role in separating them and causing them to, to, um, to be, be stable as separate ions, but it didn't really participate in the balanced reaction. It turns out for acids though, when you put acids in water, you actually wind up with the water accepting the H plus and you actually wind up but the, wa the water gains an H plus and turns into H3O plus and the chloride is just gonna float around on its own now. The chloride just gives away its H plus to the water and now the chloride can just float around on its own. 
right? So when we write these equations this way, it makes it really clear chloride is giving up an H plus. It's giving up an H plus by definition that makes it an acid. And the flip side to this is that you have to, for an acid base reaction to happen, it's a little bit like a redox reaction in that you can't have an oxidation happen without a reduction, right? If, if you have an oxidation happening where you're, something is giving up electrons, you also have to have something to accept the electrons. Same thing is true with the acids and bases. If something is giving up an H plus, you also have to have something except an H plus. And so our definition, we wind up having similar definitions for bases. In um, our, the original definition, the Arrhenius definition of a base was anything that increased the concentration of hydroxide ions, which doesn't seem all that relevant if we keep just talking about H pluses. It doesn't really make a difference. We're not talking about hydroxides. Why is Arrhenius talking about hydroxides? But we'll see why it's related in a few minutes. Um, again, the most useful and the most common way of thinking about this is that a Bronsted-Lowry base is the flip side to a Bronsted-Lowry acid. A Bronsted-Lowry acid was a proton donor. A Bronsted-Lowry base is a proton acceptor. So we look down at our example here. The HCl was our acid because it was giving away an H+. And that, by that definition, that means that the water is a base. The water accepts an H plus to turn into H3O plus. It's still an oxygen with a bunch of hydrogens attached to it. It just has an extra hydrogen now. And because that hydrogen came with a positive charge, because we're moving a proton in H plus, that means that we wind up with the charge changing on the molecule, even though the oxygen still has an oxidation state of negative one. So it's not a redox reaction because if we look at the oxidation states before and after for each of these, they all have the same charge before and after. The oxygen is negative two here and it's still negative two. The chloride is negative one and it's still negative one. All of the hydrogens are all plus one. And they're still all plus one. So if the oxidation state's not changing, then it's not redox. Even though we made things that have charges, we didn't change any oxidation states. No electrons changed hands. We just moved an H plus. Right, so that's going to be your number one criteria for is it an acid base reaction? Is can I can you show me there's an H plus on this molecule and it goes to that molecule? If you can show me that, it's an acid base reaction. <clears throat> and so let's do another practice. Here's another example. We used this problem earlier today, right? water plus ammonia turns into hydroxide in an H4 plus. <coughs> Excuse me. What's the acid and what's the base? What's donating an H plus? Any thoughts? It seems counterintuitive, but it's actually usually better to look at the things that aren't hydrogen. If you look at the oxygen before and after, you can think of the oxygen as sort of owning the hydrogens that are attached to it. If you think of it from that point of view, the oxygen on the left owns two hydrogens. The oxygen on the right only has one hydrogen. It's still oxygen, we just lost an H plus. So that means that water is acting as the acid here. 
the nitrogen has three hydrogens initially, and then it has four hydrogens. So the nitrogen accepted an H plus. Right, and so that by that definition, ammonia is the base, water is the acid. Right, and if you can see that, if we just look at these before and after in NH3, that we stuck an extra H plus on, if we stick that all together and just combine all of our hydrogens, that gives us NH4 plus. And conversely, if we started with something like, if we started with hydroxide and HCl, If we took that hydroxide and gave it an extra H plus, you take an H plus and you add it to OH minus, the charges are going to cancel out and we wind up with water. And the chloride is what gave, gave up the H plus, so we're making chloride. All right, so it's, hopefully it's getting to be easier to see why I refer to these as, as Lego reactions, because all we're doing is we're grabbing a, a Lego piece off of one model and sticking it onto the other. We're not changing what any of the pieces are. We're just rearranging them, right? That's why this is different than a redox reaction. So in this example down below, what's the acid and what's the base? So the hydroxide is the base. It's accepting an H plus. The acid is giving up an H plus. What if we did the reverse reaction for this first one? If we had start, started with hydroxide and ammonium, and they reacted together to make H2O and NH3, which is the acid and which is the base? So whatever's losing an H plus is the acid. Whatever's accepting the H plus is the base. And this, this way of thinking about it also gives us another two more vocab words. And it kind of ref allows us to sort of think of these as being pairs. When ammonia acts as a base, it always makes the same molecule. When ammonia acts as a base, it's always gonna make ammonium. So it's always gonna be paired up with the same, what's referred to as a conjugate acid.
So the conjugate acid is what the base turns into. Or the other way of thinking about it is the conjugate acid is the acid if the reaction went backward. And the reason that this is a useful terminology is because it also allows us to think of these as pairs of reaction, of pairs of things happening at the same time. Um, and so you frequently will hear people refer to them this as a conjugate acid base pair. The conjugate acid base pair are the two molecules that only differ from each other by an H plus. Would that only be ammonia? So, no, so everything that can act as an acid is going to have a conjugate base, and everything that okay. acts as a base can have a, is going to have a, its own conjugate acid. So in this case, the conjugate base, so if water is our acid, if the reaction went backwards, hydroxide would be the base. So for this particular reaction, hydroxide is the conjugate base that always will be paired up with water. When water acts as an acid, it will always make hydroxide. Water and hydroxide are linked that way. Anytime water gives up an H plus, it makes the same thing. So water and hydroxide are a conjugate acid base pair. Ammonia and ammonium are a conjugate acid base pair. It just gives us a way to label all four of the relevant pieces in an acid-base reaction because everything is, if, if it's giving up an H+, plus, it's the acid. And if it's the acid after it's lost the H+, plus, it's the conjugate base. If it's accepting the H+, plus, it's a base. And then the form that has the extra H+, plus is the conjugate acid. Right? And so they're always going to show up as the same pairs. And so with that, we are out of time. So I will spare you learning another type of nomenclature for now. We'll save that for Monday. Um, and we'll leave it with ask conjugate acid-base pairs. So I know I'm over time, but just one last time to cement it in there. Let me write a reaction up here. Hydrogen sulfate plus hydrogen carbonate can react to make H2CO3 and sulfate. All of these are going to be aqueous, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to write them all in. What's the acid? What's the base? What's the conjugate acid and the conjugate base? And again, it's going to come back down to well, hydrogen sulfate just lost a hydrogen to become sulfate, right? So that makes hydrogen sulfate the acid because hydrogen sulfate lost a proton. And the deprotonated form deprotonated, meaning without a proton, the form of hydrogen sulfate that's lost its proton is the conjugate base. So anytime hydrogen sulfate acts as an acid, it makes sulfate. And if hydrogen sulfate is the acid, That means hydrogen carbonate is the base. And if you take hydrogen carbonate and you stick an extra H plus on it, you make this compound. This is the conjugate acid. 
right? So again, they're always going to be paired up. When hydrogen carbonate acts as a base, it's always going to make the same compound. When hydrogen sulfate acts as an acid, it's always going to make the same conjugate base, right? So anytime you have, have this, this allows us to mix and match any combination, really, and allows you to be able to write to complete the reaction. Because if you know, if I say hydrogen carbonate acts as a base when you put it with water, well, that allows you to fill it in, say water plus hydrogen carbonate. If hydrogen carbonate's the base, that makes water the acid. If you know those two things, you can figure out what the products are by using these conjugate acid base pairs. All right, we're going to end there. More practice for this coming up. Um, we will have a short quiz on some of this nomenclature and on some of the precipitation stuff um, over the weekend. I'd like to give you the weekend off since we only had one lecture, but because we had only had one lecture, we need to catch up. Um, so we will still have a quiz over the weekend. Watch for it to go live tomorrow once I've made sure that the questions are all, all good and proofread. And if you have lab today, if, or if you don't and you have time, um, jump in in 10 minutes at 3.35 and do a quick uh, intro to this week's lab, which is about acids and bases as well. All right, I will see you there or I will see you on Monday.